So, as I said, it's the third Sunday in Lent, and we're, we're thinking, obviously, in Lent about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and the cross and his ultimate sacrifice of giving up his life for us, for me, and for you. And the title of the scripture passage we have this morning, or at least the first half of it, is Repent or Perish. Repent or Perish. Now, that's, that's a pretty um, strong statement, isn't it? It's fairly stark. But it's, it's exactly what Jesus himself said, as we will hear in a moment. You know, his words. And it's not the repent bit that's a problem, because the call to repentance was Jesus' mission, wasn't it? That's what he came to do. He called people to repent and, and be baptized. And it was the mission for John the Baptist before him. He did the same thing. The baptism was a sign of Repentance. So when Jesus left his followers, at the end of Matthew's gospel we read, he said, uh, he commanded them to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them. He was talking about them, um, calling them, calling people to, to turn to him, turn away from other things and turn to him, and to mark that with baptism. Now, in the amplified version um, of the, the Bible, the scriptures, uh, the word for repent is Obviously amplified, it's broadened a bit. And it, it clarifies it as follows. It says, change your mind for the better and heartily amend your ways. It's important. It's not just saying you're sorry. It's changing your mindset and amending your ways with abhorrence or just hatred of your past sins. Turning away from sin, turning towards God. And that's what we were celebrating um, just last Sunday, wasn't it? As, as six people publicly declared their intention to follow Jesus, to turn and follow him and to leave um, human nature behind as far as possible. And the water itself symbolizes being washed clean again. So the old habits, the, the sin, are washed away and you come up fresh and new and clean emerge into new life. So repent and perish. Now, for most of us, it's the perish bit that's the problem, isn't it? We don't like to say to people, repent or perish. It's a bit, well, it doesn't seem very loving, does it? Or kind, for a start. But I'm going to put that in context. I'm going to read the first nine verses of chapter 13 in Luke's Gospel. You can follow it in the Bible or by reading it on the screen, or if you prefer, you can listen or you can look at it on your phone, whatever. Okay, Luke 13. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too, unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, then fine. If not, then you can cut it down. At first glance, that may look like two different themes, but it's not. Jesus is using the parable, parable <coughs> sorry, to illustrate his very stark warning of repent perish. And Jesus, of course, didn't mince his words, did he? He said it as it was. 
The death of the Galileans while they offered sacrifices and the death of those crushed by the tower in Siloam was not, contrary to popular belief at that time, a direct result of their sin or even the sin of their forefathers. So twice Jesus told those who were listening that they would perish too unless they repented. We haven't got time to look at the significance of these two um, instances of people dying because I want to concentrate on the parable itself this morning. But Jesus is not talking about perish as in after death you will go to hell as opposed to not going to hell, going to heaven. Um, he's talking about their, their then current, current political situation. It was a warning of the, mil, of the political and military consequences of ignoring his call. Because many of them were intent on following the path of rebellion. And he's saying, if you continue to do that, if you continue, continue to seek an earthly kingdom while rejecting the kingdom of God... Then, then you will perish as individuals, as a nation. And of course, that is exactly what happened later on. And he illustrates this with the parable of the fig tree. Now, to state the blindingly obvious, the purpose of a fig tree is to produce figs. Okay. It's not an ornament. It's meant to produce fruit. The owner is running out of patience because after three years, there is still no fruit. So he's thinking about uprooting it. That would leave space for another tree or for something else. But the gardener requests a stay of execution. He wants to give the tree just one last chance, and he says he's going to do everything possible to encourage it to fruit. Obviously, then, if it fails to do so, then it, it, it's chopped. Now, Jesus was speaking to people who were very familiar with the scriptures, and they would have recognized that this was extremely similar to parables, stories in the Old Testament, such as in Isaiah, where God said through Isaiah that his people were like a vineyard that was really well looked after. He'd done everything he possibly could for it. And despite all of that, all it produced was sour grapes. And he said, so what am I going to do? I'm going to let it grow wild. I'm going to abandon it. He was saying to them, if you don't follow God's commandments... Not the sacrifice bit, but seeking justice and mercy. If you don't follow God's commandments, then you will be destroyed. Lots of warnings, lots of prophets throughout the Old Testament said the same thing, but they continued their own way. Sometimes they repented and then went back, a seesaw. And despite the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to whom, you know, who would have been among the people listening to Jesus, they thought they, thought they were upholding God's law to the last dot. But Jesus thought otherwise. Jesus knew otherwise. He knew that their hearts weren't right before God. Their motives weren't right. They were teaching the people the letter of the law, but not the substance of the law. God's ways, his laws they taught, but not his person, not his character. And the idea is here in church, and, and that, by that I include you know, mini church, kids church, youth church, church, the whole purpose of church. All of it should be focusing on the teaching of God, but through the lens of the three persons of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with the aim of bringing everyone to a personal experience of who God is, of his heart of compassion, his love, his mercy, and his restoration. And our aim being that is, is only what Jesus did. He used the scriptures, he used the law 
which he knew extremely well, of course, to show God's heart. Not to trip people up, but to show God's heart. And that's why so many people flocked to him. They didn't flock to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They flocked to Jesus. Because they recognized through his teaching about the person of God, their need of God, the need of his person, not just his laws. This parable can be interpreted in at least two ways, and I'm not going to go into either of them for the sake of time. But whichever way you look at the parable, the end result is identical. If there is no fruit, the tree will be cut down. That's the bottom line. So where are we in this parable? You? And where am I in this parable? Where are we as a fellowship in this parable? Let's start with us as individuals. Obviously, I can only speak for myself, but you might see some parallels. God has invested a huge amount in me. Obviously, the the one that he's done for all of us, he's invested in us, in that he gave his son to die for us. That's obviously the foundation of all that he's invested in me. But more than that, from an early age, despite having parents who really had no connection to faith, he provided neighbors who took me to church and he provided me with with fellowship through whom I came to know his love. And I accepted it personally too as a teenager. And when at uni I came off the rails completely, he didn't abandon me. There were still people there who were trying to encourage me. And when I went to work, again, someone there who made me think, I know I'm missing out. I'm missing out on God. I'm not only missing out, I needed God in my life. So I came back to fellowship with God and I flourished. Although to my shame, my life wasn't always yielding fruit. Not good fruit anyway. But God persevered. The third song that we sang Um, about the goodness of God and him being so faithful. That really resonates with me and his, his love just pursuing me. God persevered. His compassion and his grace never failed. And despite my being so imperfect, God called me to preach and then to ministry. And he's given me gifts to use for his glory. Now, I was going to to say, I don't know why he has invested so much in me, but I do. It's so that I will produce fruit. That's why he invests in all of us, each and every one of us. In this parable, I envisage a tree that looks alive. Not a tree that is just twigs and nothing else. I mean, why would you go and look for figs on a tree with, with no, nothing? I'm thinking of a tree that looks as though it should be producing fruit because it's got lots of, of healthy-looking leaves and so on. And that's one of the reasons I find this parable incredibly challenging and a wake-up call for me. Is that what I am? Am I uh, a healthy-looking tree with lots of foliage but not much fruit? And here I'm thinking not just of the of the fruits of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, probably missed one out, there are nine but also the fruit that produces seeds with the potential to produce more fruit. Because I believe that's the sort of fruit God is seeking from me and from you. Now, of course, your story is very different. It's unique to you. It would be. But I have no doubt that God has invested a huge amount in you over the years. And he's looking for you to be fruitful too. Why else would he have told his disciples to make disciples of other people if it wasn't for that? And then as a fellowship, how fruitful are we? 
it's possible to have lots and lots of activity. And we are known for being a very active church. But it's possible to have lots of activity without fruit. Which is why when we were forced to close during lockdown and when we were reopening, we wanted to be intentional about activities that gave possibilities for, for fruit. And if you come down to our cafe on a, on a Thursday or a Friday morning, you can be part of that blessing. You can see people's lives changed. And they say that. You know, one young mum, you've saved my life. That was a small talk. You've saved my life. You've changed my life completely. That's what's happening. It's happening Thursday and Friday with a cafe. It's happening on Wednesday with our small talk groups, both of them. God is at work in and through us. We are blessing others through the blessings he have given, has given us. And that's fruit. And we continue to pray that from the cafe, from small talks, and from conversations we have, we will see more and more people coming to know just how much Jesus loves them as an individual. How much he's invested in them, despite the fact that they haven't even known who he was, maybe for however many years it might be. And we pray that also he will, they will come to recognize their need of the new life that Jesus offers. And we pray in thankful anticipation of the day that they too will want to be baptized as a symbol of the new life that they have, as a symbol of their turning away from the old life and embracing the new life wholeheartedly. That's the sort of fruit that God is looking for in his people. I just want to invite you to take a moment to reflect. I'm going to say a prayer at the end, but just to reflect, do you perhaps like me need to repent of the lack of fruit in your life? Maybe currently, maybe times in the past. Perhaps to reflect if there's any activity, foliage, in your life that needs pruning to promote growth of his work, the fruit. at home, please consider a time of repentance for us as a fellowship for our times of lack of fruitfulness. And our nation, once known as a Christian nation, we're far from that now. We're not really a Christian country. We don't, as a nation, honor God. And it is scriptural for us to repent on behalf of others. Daniel did it. It's an integral part of intercession. We're interceding for people. We are repenting on their behalf even though it's not our responsibility, necessarily individually. So let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you, the God of compassion, who is so, so faithful to us, so, so good to us, who's always working in and through our lives and the lives of other people, even when we can't see it, we don't realize it. You are always working on our behalf. Help us to be fruitful, we pray. We thank you for all that you have invested in us. We thank you for the privilege you have given us of serving you. And we pray, Father, that our fruit will bring you and your kingdom much honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.